There's now less than two weeks to go in the transfer window and Manchester United still have so much more to do. Will Jadon Sancho finally be signed? What's happening with Alex Tellez? Could players like Jesse Lingard and Chris Smalling be leaving? To discuss all of that and to discuss Patrice Evra's interview, Ed Woodward, Matt Judge, the Glazers, everything really, I'm joined today by Rob Dawson from ESPN. Thank you very much for your time today, Rob. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, obviously, United, the start of the season has not exactly gone well, has it? We've had the 3-1 defeat to Crystal Palace and large parts of that game against Luton were pretty dire in what was a second string. 11, but United won 3-0 and I suppose you can take some promise from that. But no United fan is under any illusion that we need new signings and Jadon Sancho is the name that has been at the top of the list all summer long that is still not a Manchester United player. But still, it seems that United are somewhat confident somehow I don't, honestly don't know how, but that we can sign him. Uh, what's, uh, what do you know, Rob? Uh, what's being said by the club? Has anything changed? And do you really think there's any chance that United will play this poker game with Dortmund that we've been playing all summer long and actually sign him in the last couple of weeks? Well, I mean, it, I think it's pretty widely known that, that he was United's top target um, ahead of this transfer window. Um, United have are still saying that they have not given up um, trying to sign him. The word from Dortmund in Germany is that that's probably not going to happen now. They've been quite resolute um, in their statements privately to, to German media that um, that he's not going anywhere now, um, that they were willing at one stage to, to talk, but it hasn't progressed in the way that they thought it might and that they just don't want to lose such a key player this close to, um, to the deadline, which you can understand. Um, you know, with things like this, until United tell us that it's it's dead and buried and there's no chance, um, obviously there, there is still a chance. You know, there is still um, you know that hope. I think at United that maybe something can be salvaged and that he may be a Man United player by the time that the window closes. But from a, a personal point of view, I think that with each day that passes, it, it becomes less and less likely. I think maybe the um, you know the time for for serious negotiation has has been and gone, um, which will be unfortunate because you know he was. He was the man, really, that Ollie wanted. You know, he was he was the the top of the list for an area of the squad that he really felt needed strengthening. You know, he fit the bill in, in lots of ways for Ollie in terms of age profile, ability, personality off the off the field, um, and it, it is unfortunate. I mean, I, it it may have been different had the coronavirus pandemic not hit. You know, obviously that is a, an issue this summer. Um, and again, I said that there is still a chance that he may be a United player, but um, it's. It's a faint hope at the moment, at best, I think. Surely, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is going to be, let's be honest, a bit pissed off about this because Sancho has been the top target all summer. It's clear that United do have the cash to sign him. Well, well, apparently not. But do you feel that Solskjaer will be extremely frustrated with, with Ed Woodward, with Matt Judge, with United in how they've, I suppose, not backed him in the same way that Chelsea have backed Lampard, that... Klopp has been back with Thiago coming in, that all the managers around him are getting the players in what's supposed to be an impossible market, but United have just sat here with Donny van der Beek. Yeah, I mean, I think behind the scenes there probably is quite a lot of frustration. I mean, United fans will know that, that Oli is not the type of character to come out and blast the owners in the media in the way that we saw maybe Mourinho do a couple of times when, when he went through the same issues. I think that the frustration for Oli is that he will know that ultimately if, if things don't go well this season, he'll be the one to pay the price. And that last season, he felt that progress had been made. I think a lot of the fans would, would probably agree with that. And the message that he sent out after that season was that now is the time to take the next step. You know, it's, it's time to start closing the gap with City and Liverpool and, and challenging possibly for a Premier League title. And you look at the squad now with a, with a couple of weeks left of the transfer window and, you know, not only has is, is that ground not really been made up in terms of squad strength, you could, you could probably argue that they've been left behind again a little bit. You know, the, the club really that have made the biggest strides, you would think, this summer at Chelsea because of the money they've spent. Liverpool won the league by a considerable distance last year and have gone out of the way to strengthen again. Something that Sir Alex Ferguson used to do regularly after winning the title, go out and spend and improve again. City seem to have plugged gaps where they had them in their squad and, and looked to be signing another defender as well before the deadline. Um, Spurs have, have had a boost by bringing back Gareth Bale. So I've... It's difficult with Oli because, as I say, he's not ever going to come out and, and really monster the owners. Um, I think privately there is a lot of frustration there because, um, you know, he's a he is a smart guy and 
it, it won't be lost on him that um, that there are issues in that squad and that if those don't get fixed before the deadline, um, it could be a, another long season. Well, as I said, there's less, there's just less than two weeks. Uh, and Jaden Sancho is obviously the top of the list, but maybe we all have to consider that unrealistic at this point because of, as you say, Dortmund not wanting to lose him so late in the window. But what about other players? Obviously, Alex Tellez has done the main, uh, le the left back from Porto is being linked uh, with United. What do you know is the latest on Tellez to United? Because of a couple of weeks ago, you have Fabrizio Romano reporting that the personal terms have already been agreed, but since then, there's not really been any sort of movement in terms of the fee, which is only supposed to be around about 20, 25 million euros, which seems pretty damn reasonable for a 27-year-old left-back with Champions League experience in Tellez. Yeah, I, mean, I think there is hope at United that, that their business is not done. Um, you know, you've mentioned there that they've signed Donny van der Beek, um, a good signing for a, for a decent price, it, it seems like. Um, I know, I know there is a lot of negativity from fans around what United have done in this window, but United feel confident that they will bring in at least one um, who that will be, I'm not sure. The, the Alex Tellis stuff is um, is ongoing. Um, you know, United haven't knocked that down as a as a possibility. Um, you know, it's it's not an area of a squad particularly that you would look at and think that is the the key priority um, because you've got Luke Shaw there and, and Brandon Williams. Um, it, it's an area that we were told earlier in the summer that United would like to strengthen if possible, but the priority still was a right winger. Um, I think Alex Tellers is one of those that, that came up, was they were made aware of his possible availability and, and have looked to explore that. Um, again, you, you've mentioned there, it, it comes down to whether they can uh, agree a fee. I mean, personal terms in, in this kind of instance don't really mean anything because lots of, lots of players are desperate to play for Man United and Alex Tellers is one of those. So when they get the opportunity, personal terms aren't really an issue. It is you know, generally about negotiating a deal with Porto. Um, he is one of their key players. They're not going to let him go on the cheap. Um, you know, United want to be in a position this summer where they're not um, overpaying for players. Um, they've made, they've been consistent in that in that message that they have to be very careful with resources, particularly this summer because of the coronavirus pandemic. And, and not only that, that they they just don't know what the future lies financially. Um, so they've they want to be very careful. I and mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Alex Tellers came in because the, the signs are positive, but. On, you know, we've seen so many times that until he's, he's outside Old Trafford with a scarf above his head, you know, anything can happen. Yeah, I think that's one thing that all United fans will agree with. In terms of uh, players leaving United, that's probably equally, maybe not equally as important, but very important for United to do this summer as well. Now, Jesse Lingard is a player, you wrote yourself an article about Jose Mourinho's admiration for him and whether or not he could potentially go to Spurs, maybe with Deli Alli leaving. Uh, what's the latest on Lingard, and is that still the case? And was that performance and that start against Luton maybe his last in a United shirt? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you've made a pretty good point there that it's, it isn't just about signing players this summer. It is about um, getting rid of, of perhaps the fringe players. Um, the issue, one of the issues that United have got, is that they've got an awful lot of players sort of around the first team squad who are on quite long contracts, being paid very, very well because they're Man United players. Um, players with with very few prospects of playing this this season for Oli and United want to to get those off the books and create space in the squad, raise a bit of money and spend those spend that money on on incoming transfers. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't have to, I don't have to list the players that are available to be sold. I mean, you can probably tell yourself by the players that um, that didn't travel to Luton or weren't in the matchday squad at Luton or were on the bench and didn't get any minutes. Um, Jesse Lingard is is a bit of a different case in that United are very very keen to keep their homegrown players. Um, Oli likes Jesse Lingard, um, wants to keep him in the squad, but can't make any promises in terms of regular first-team football. From Jesse's point of view, he thinks that he has worked particularly hard this summer to get fit. You know, he went away to Greece and hired a personal trainer to make sure that he was ready to go when training started. Um, he was a little bit, bit surprised and, and very disappointed that he didn't make the squad for Crystal Palace. And he feels at 27 that it's time that he plays regularly because he's still got England ambitions. You know, the last England got to a World Cup semi-final with him as a, a star man. So um, it's right that he he wants to, to go and play regularly. Um, I think there is going to be a little bit of an impasse perhaps with, with Jesse in that United have, have made it clear to him that it's very, very difficult for them to replace homegrown players and that um, the price that they would look to to sell him for is inflated by the fact that he's come through the academy, that he's English um, and that he's, you know, Man United born and bred kind of thing. Um, 
from Jesse's point of view, he wants to play regular games. Ideally, he would love to do that at Man United. He loves the club. Um, he wants to stay, but he is smart enough to know that um, you know, it may not be the case this season, that there is a lot of competition in, in those positions. And Oli has kind of made it clear, I think, that there are other people ahead of him in the pecking order. So, um, you know, I wouldn't say that it's it's definite that he's going to leave, but it's it's certainly one to keep an eye out on, um, you know, particularly if, if Jesse doesn't make the squad for Brighton or, or the games in between now and the, the deadline, because that's only going to um, fuel his desire to go out and play regular, regularly somewhere else. So um, the next couple of weeks will be important for him. I, I, wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't rule out him leaving, but again, he's it, it, not someone that United want to lose particularly and certainly aren't looking to sell on the cheap. Now, as I said, the, the talk at the moment is going to be around the transfers because there's only a couple of weeks left, but there are so many issues at United that it's impossible to talk about United and just talk about transfers. And you yourself did an article a couple of weeks ago uh, that sort of focused on the spending of United and, it, it, and it, it reflected a video I did in terms of where I see a trend happening of United spending bigger when they're outside of the Champions League to get back in it the following season and then spending being reduced when we're back in it. Because I, well, on a personal level, I feel that's because United's strategy as a club has changed from one that's geared towards winning trophies that one that is geared towards getting back in that top four and using that as, as the, the mantle of success. Is that a, a sentiment that you share? Is that a sentiment that's shared in the media? Or is it is that just something that you feel maybe me as a United fan, that's something that I wouldn't focus on a little bit too much? Well, firstly, I, I would say that obviously it's, it's a theory that United reject um, because you know they, are, they consistently say that they are geared toward winning trophies. And obviously they would say that. And you know it's clear that Ed Woodward, whenever he speaks in those investor calls, he, he says that. But then he, he has to say that because he's um, the chief executive of, of Manchester United and he can't say anything else. What I would also say with that, though, is that the numbers don't lie. Um, you know, since 2013, I think, it's, I think it's around 160 million spent in summers after the club have missed out on the Champions League. In summers after they've... Um, qualified it, it halves um, it's around 85 million so you're talking about an average over about seven years um, I think it's it's fine if United want to reject that um, and, and of course they would um, but you know a lot of United fans like yourself can can see that there is a little bit of a trend developing and you know I think that there are outside factors clearly but you're talking about an average so it's, it's a fair reflection I think of what's happened over the last seven years that, that fans um, like yourself have noticed that spending seems to go up when they're trying to go get back in the Champions League and, and that that is a worry because um, you're not talking about a one-off you're talking about an average over nearly a decade um, I mean it's it's difficult because because United consistently say that it's, it's very very difficult to to sign players um, they are shopping in a very small pool which I understand they will point to the the level of investment since 2013 I think they the number that they come up with is around 900 million spent on players they feel that that's comparable to the likes of City and Chelsea, who, you know, they point out are have got very, very different ownership models. You know, they they feel that they can compete with with clubs who are owned by states or, or, or oligarchs, um, and they they use that as a as an example of, of why they think that their ownership model works. Um, I, the problem I've got with with the spending is that this summer feels very, very much like Jose Mourinho in 2018. Um, you know, he went through quite a, a tough season in his first year. His second season, United yeah, finished second, reached an FA Cup final. They, they didn't really challenge City for the title, but, um, you know, they were second and it was the highest finish since Alex Ferguson retired. Every journalist who turned up on that pre-season tour to America that summer expected him to be backed with the next pieces of the puzzle. And Jose Mourinho had made it very clear to the club, the, the pieces of the puzzle that he wanted, the players had been identified. Um, and it became very apparent very quickly on that tour that he just wasn't going to get the money that he wanted. Um, and that was one of the reasons why his mood disintegrated during that tour. Um, and it began to unravel very quickly that, that they started poorly and by December he was sacked. Um, and I think there are parallels with, with this summer. You know, it's another season where United seems to have taken a step forward, a manager who has very clearly defined areas of the squad where he wants to improve, very clearly defined targets. And as things stand, it looks like the manager might not get those. Um, you can you see by the result of Crystal Palace that the season hasn't started off 
very well, um, just as it didn't for Jose Mourinho, and and we all know how that know that how how that ended. Um, I think that's a worry for me. I think that that really you have to be investing from a point of strength. Um, I can understand why there's large investment to try and get back in the Champions League because you know United need that Champions League money. Um, but I would go back to what I said earlier about Sir Alex Ferguson. Sir Alex Ferguson would always invest from a point of uh, a position of strength. Um, and I think that would that was vital this summer. And, and unfortunately, as things stand, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. And, and fans who may have ended last season thinking, you know, we're going to watch another season of progress and maybe get close to Liverpool and City are now worried that they're going to face another season of scrapping for the top four, which, you know, frankly, isn't good enough for a club of United size. Yeah, I think we're all pretty bored of that. What seems like a cycle of, you know, take give with one hand and then take away with the other. And somebody... Clearly, who feels like that is Patrice Evra. Uh, obviously, you saw his interview, well, not his interview, sorry, just his, his monologue, I suppose, that he did on Instagram, a 20-minute video where he really didn't hold back. Uh, it's sort of really highlighting the problems at United and highlighting individual names. Uh, he, he steered away from really pointing the finger at Ed Woodward, but he didn't really hold back in Matt Judge. And uh, Matt Judge is uh, a very corporate man at United. He was involved, like Ed Woodward was, with the actual leverage buyer of United, but he is at the same time, I think since 2016, in charge of United's player negotiations and the new contracts. Uh, what's your opinion on whatever I had to say, uh, just as, as a general thing, because he really did attack United and attack a lot of people for saying that they're damaging the club just by being there. And at that point, he didn't name any names, but we all know who he's talking about. So I wanted to get your opinion on whatever actually said. I mean, I, I thought it was it was explosive, really. I mean, I think that word is probably used a, a bit too much in our industry, but you know, I think that was genuinely um, explosive stuff from a guy who has obviously been a player there, but has also been in the building relatively recently. Um, he was he was doing bits of his coaching badges at, at Carrington up until fairly recently. So this is a guy. This isn't a guy that's just sort of you know been been away from the club and away from the game for a long time and has come in with his two pennies worth. I mean, he's been in the building and around that club very very recently. So. Um, you, know, you, you have to think that he knows exactly what he's talking about. I mean, I think the one line that that I mean, I'm not surprised. I mean, shocked me a little bit. I guess was that you know he's had a, a phone call from a, a sporting director asking him to tell Matt Judge to answer his phone. I mean, for a football for a United fan to to look at that and read that, if that is true, I and mean, that is just it's amateurish. You know, that's not how the biggest clubs in the world operate in the transfer market. And um, you know, I think a lot of United fans will look at that and go. I told you so. That's that's the kind of impression that the club has given off for a while now. Um, I mean, I think it, it is important to to mention the flip side of this. I mean, I, I haven't since covering United, I haven't known many transfers that have gone through very very smoothly. But I think they do they do deserve credit for the way that Donny Van de Beek was handled. Um, you know, that seemed to be very smooth, very quick. Agreed a fee with Ajax very quickly. Personal terms done, and then all of a sudden he's a United player. And I thought that was um, that was good and. and Ed Woodward and, and Matt Judge and, and the club deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, but it can't just be a one-off. That has to be the way that they operate again and again and again. And I think the, one of the frustrations with the United fans is that they look at other clubs again. They look at City, link with Ferran Torres and the deal's done. Link with Nathan Aki, pay the money, the deal's done. Liverpool, there was, there was barely any noise about um, Jota from Wolves. And the next minute, he's a Liverpool player. Um, you know, Thiago was a little bit more dragged out, but again, it's, it's from the point of agreed fee, we're talking, and then it's it's done very quickly. Same with Chelsea; their business has been very impressive, and I think that's that's one of the the huge frustrations that United fans have got that United don't seem to be able to do that kind of deal consistently. Um, and it's stories like the one that Patrice told about Matt Judge that will worry United fans that you know that they just haven't got the required skills in the transfer market to get the right deals over the line and improve the squad. Um, you know, it's all very well to, for fans to kind of speculate that that's going on. It's all very well for journalists to write bits that, you know, maybe the, the way that the, the club is set up isn't, isn't the right way. But when you, you hear a guy like Patrice come out and say it, and say it in, that, in such plain terms, um, it's shocking, frankly. And, um, you know, I, I know that he got a lot of support and uh, was applauded for, for coming out and saying it. Um, you know, and, and if, it, if, it, if it highlights a, a problem that United have got and... and makes them act and makes them change the way that they do business and great because United fans want their club to to be more 
slick in a transfer market, I think is, is the word. And um, we haven't seen that very often. No, we, we certainly haven't. Uh, and something I wanted to ask you, Robert, as a journalist, you're going to be dealing with plenty of players, plenty of agents, plenty of different clubs. Have you gauge an opinion of how other clubs feel about United in the transfer market. So, like for example, do other clubs, players and agents look at United and just, as you say, feel like we're amateurish in how we deal with things? Is that, is that something that's reflected in how other clubs approach United? And is that something that you've seen, I suppose, or heard of firsthand from different agents or different players? Yeah, I mean, what Patrice said you know, was explosive because it was Patrice, but it's 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 not something that that we as a as a group of journalists who follow United haven't heard from time to time um, about United in the past. You know, there are certain agents, intermediaries, players who have had similar things to say about the way that United do business. You know, you, stories about players coming to the end of contract and just not getting a phone call, or players waiting for for one year options to be triggered and finding out to, by via a letter that drops on the doormat. You know, having no phone call, no no contact, and then suddenly the they start thinking, well, they're going to have to leave, and then all of a sudden a letter drops on the doormat, and it's United saying, "Oh, you're staying for another year." Um, academy players, in particular, thinking that that they they're at a club that really really wants to look after them and and you know protect their long term future, but just not hearing anything about their contract situations. You know, what's going to happen in the next step, and um, and it can be quite worrying for a lot of players that they just don't seem to have that that communication. Um, I think communication probably is a quite a, a serious problem. Um, you know, you only have to look at the way that Ander Herrera left. Um, you know, he he didn't hear anything. He got to the point where he thought, "Well, I'm gonna, I need to look after my family. I need to start talking to someone else." And, and he says that the reason he started speaking to PSG was because he was worried that he was just going to be left without a contract. You know, United came in very very late with an offer. It wasn't actually until Ole Gunnar Solskjaer came in and 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 personally intervened that there was actually serious talks you know, started. But by that point, it was too late and, and Ander Herrera went and signed for PSG. Um, you know, it's, it, we do hear these stories quite often. Um, you know, they're, they're not always um, just about United, but it's, you hear them about United more so than other clubs. Um, I think part of the problem perhaps is that, that there aren't enough football people at the top of the club. I mean, that's, that's not a new thing. I think lots of United fans will, would point that out. Um, you know, other clubs have got football people in charge. You just have to look at, at City. Their transfers are handled by Chiki Bagheristan, who who knows exactly how that business works. And players respond to him and, and like the way that he talks to them. And I think United um, would probably benefit from having someone like that at the top of the club who, who represents the club in when they talk to players and talks to agents and talk to other clubs. Um, you know, whether that happens down the line, or, I'm not sure. Um, in my opinion, it's something that probably needs to happen um, you know again if if it happens I'm not sure it's, it's something that's been moved for a long time but has never really seemed to come to fruition yeah I think I think if United were going to get a director of football by now we would have got a director of football by now but again coming down to how United fans feel it would it feels like that would be Ed Woodward relinquishing some of his power uh, which he doesn't really want to do but no matter how you look at United one thing I do want to say, actually, quickly, to finish on, is something that Ebra pointed out about the Glazers, how he met Avram Glazer, and he had absolutely no idea what was going on at United. And that is equally as worrying, because Ed Woodward is in a very big position of power at United, in the idea that he is the Glazers' first point of call. And therefore, what they learn about what is going on at United is going to come from the mouth of Ed Woodward, and nowhere else really, because let's be honest, the Glazers are owners of football clubs, and like most owners of football clubs, they aren't going to be that interested in the day-to-day -day running and activities of it. Does, is that something you feel that United fans should be worried about in terms of the absolute power that Ed Woodward seems to have at United and how that doesn't really seem to have been challenged in the last five, six, seven years, despite the fact that there are so many obvious misgivings and failings by the board and the people who are running, as you say, the, the non-football people who are running United? I, mean, I think that, that that maybe is a little bit of a myth that it's just kind of the football club is run by Ed Woodward with an iron fist and no one else gets gets anywhere near him. And I, I think 
Um, you know, it it is run by committee. I mean, obviously, Ed Woodward is in charge of the day-to-day running. Um, I think there's a, a little bit of a myth, perhaps, that he is more heavily involved in transfers than, than he is. I mean, you know, United have got a, a whole recruitment department. Um, they've got Ollie, who's also picking players. Um, both of those have got a veto with certain players. So it's not it's not a case of sort of Ed Woodward picking and choosing who to sign and deciding himself what a player is worth and what they're not worth. Um, I, I was a little bit surprised to find out a few years ago how involved the Glazers are that, you know, in terms of selling players, that everything um, appears to be signed off by the Glazers. You know, stories of of players who who have sorted moves away and are just kind of waiting for that sign off from, from the Glazers to say that whether they can go or not. Um, so I think perhaps the Glazers are a little bit more involved than perhaps many fans um, realise. Um, I think what I would say just, I mean, obviously the, Ed Woodward did not come out well with, with what Patrice ever said and, you know, everyone can see that. But um, what I would say about Ed is that it's not a case of him just going blindly down the road and, and sticking to what, what he knows. Um, you know, he has made an attempt, the club have made an attempt in the last couple of years to, to revamp the way that they do transfers. Ed recognises that there was a problem, particularly under Louis van Gaal, um, that the way that they signed players was not, um, just did not work. They, they were signing the wrong players. Um, that They have looked to try and change that. You know, they are making strides in, in revamping their recruitment department and the way that they identify talent, go after it and then sign it. Obviously, this isn't something that can be done overnight and we are still seeing you know, United sort of lag behind a little bit. But the hope is that, that eventually... You know everything will be a lot more slick. The the problem is that that proof will be in the pudding. You know fans don't care particularly about what goes on behind the scenes. They want to see the world's best players signed for Man United. Um, at the moment, from a fan's perspective, it, it seems like they're struggling with that. Um, and I can understand that that is the case. Um, it, it's very difficult. I can understand United's point of view. You know it, it isn't a simple process, particularly signing players or running a club that size. I can understand the fans' frustration as well because they pay good money to watch them every week. They want to see the best players. They don't want to follow a club that is a, a soap opera. Um, there has to be a happy medium somewhere. That there has to be, um, you know, a bit of give and take. I think that the frustration is valid, and like I say, that the, the proof will be in the pudding with United if if they're signing the best players in the world regularly um, and getting what what appear to be good deals. Then the fans' frustration will wane. Um, they just want to see a, a good team on the field. I mean. Um, and, and challenging the trophy is something that you know United haven't really done for for seven years. Yeah, but when you break it down like that, it's, it's a simple, that's all United fans are frustrated at. We just want to have the team that we feel is capable of challenging for the title. And if you finish third last year, this was an opportunity for United to back Solskjaer, to break that pattern that we've seen since Fergie retired, and to actually really try and break into that top two. Maybe that will still happen. Maybe in a couple of weeks' time, we will get late deals done and we will go into this season properly with a better squad. But history, unfortunately, tells us that really won't be the case and not with the powers that be United that are in charge and running things. Uh, Really appreciate your time today, Rob. Uh, Hopefully, you've all enjoyed this chat. Really interesting points there made about about the Glazers, obviously updates on Jesse Lingard, Jaden Sancho, or, or no, whether that's going to happen or not, let's find out. But really appreciate your time, Rob, today. Um, make sure you follow Rob on Twitter. You'll be able to see his uh, tag on here. And make sure you read, obviously, all his articles over on ESPN. But maybe we can chat again soon, hopefully, after we sign Sancho Tellez. I don't know, another centre-back as well. Hopefully. Hopefully. Right, take it easy, Rob. Mm-hmm.